Busch Stadium. Bob Costas along with Tony Kubek. Right-hander Don Heinkel making his first National League start. Retired the Mets without incident in the top half of the first. Dwight Gooden struggled in the bottom half. He was ahead of Vince Coleman one and two. Lost him and walked him. And then Doc wasn't able to hold Coleman close enough. Vince stole second against Barry Lyons with a head first slide. He is now 43 for 43 lifetime in steal attempts against the Mets. Ozzie Smith back in the starting lineup for the first time in the regular season. They just reactivated him before the game and optioned reserve infielder Rod Booker to Louisville. Ozzie advanced Coleman to third with a sharp ground ball to second. So the cards had a man at third with one out. But Terry Pendleton on a check swing was called out on strikes on a 3-2 pitch for the second out. Then after Pedro Guerrero walked to put runners at first and third, Milt Thompson, who had been a hot hitter, 11 of 22 to open the season, grounded sharply to second base, and that concluded the last half of the first as the Cardinals stranded two. And in that inning, we saw Doc Gooden very quickly. Doc Gooden, the pitcher. Here is the Mets lineup against Don Heinkel, released by the Tigers last year, Bob. We've got a lot of speed up front now with the lineup adjustment for the Mets. Keith Hernandez, last night, hit in the fifth spot, the first time in his Met career that he's hit anywhere other than third. Dykstra at the top. He's been more or less alternating with Mookie Wilson. Lions the catcher today. Day game after a night game, so Gary Carter sits it out. Howard Johnson having trouble. It's more mental block now than physical with his throwing from third. Sits out the second consecutive game, and they use lefty swinging Dave Magadan at third base. Here's Hernandez. And a strike called distinctively by the plate umpire, Dutch Renner. Hernandez still having a little trouble with the left elbow, bursitis, because he can't take his normal practice swings, so he saves the swings he does take for game action. Gooden snapped one heck of a curveball off on Pendleton, three and two, didn't he? And then pitched around Guerrero. Didn't want the big RBI guy to hurt him. Hernandez goes to the opposite field, and Coleman tracks it down near the line. And I think the scouting reports have gotten around a little bit on Keith, knowing that he didn't have many at-bats in spring training. The elbow still troubling him slightly. It looked like they shortened up on him and swung around more toward left field, and Coleman was playing down the line. Hernandez with a career batting average of exactly 300, but he dipped to 276 and spent a long stretch on the disabled list with a hamstring pull last year. Magadan has had but seven at-bats so far this season. Fastball for a strike from Heinfeld. His fastball is only average. The fork ball might be his best pitch, combined with a pretty good slider. It's interesting how he approaches pitching with nobody on base. He will go to the fork ball grip in his glove right now. Liner to second, Okendo. Many times that fork ball is tipped off if you go with a fastball or breaking ball grip, and then when you have to jam it in with your glove hand between your fingers, it's a tip off. So what Heinkel does with nobody on, he puts it in the fork ball grip and goes the other way. It causes a problem with a man on base, because if he goes to the fork ball grip and he has to throw over to first base, the runner can get a better lead. Hard to pick off now. See him jam it in? Barry Lyons down and away for ball one two down nobody on top half of the second no score on a gorgeous day in St. Louis this ball is wrapped to left and Coleman won't get it against the fence Lyons for the double Coleman's thrown out in time with the age on Gary Carter, and of course he's had some severe knee problems lately again, and the throwing arm gun, some feel that Lyons should be catching almost every day. Carter in the last year of his contract as is Hernandez. Maybe Johnson feels if he can get 115 games behind the plate and get 60 to 70 RBIs, Carter will have had a good year. That was the Mets' second hit. Darrell Strawberry had a two-out single in the first off Heinkel. First base open, the eighth place hitter. Elster is a very hot hitter, as you see by the average. Gooden coming up next. Uh, I would think they would not give him too much good to hit. But Doc's of course, a pretty good hitter. Exactly. 
you still would rather pitch to a pitcher than a hot eighth place hitter. Heinkel came to camp with only an outside shot at making the Cardinal roster, forced his way on through a combination of circumstances, his own fine performance and the disabling injuries to Danny Cox and Greg Matthews. Elster, a better hitter so far this season in spring training simply because Bill Robinson, the hitting instructor, has got him going the opposite way more. Staying with breaking balls and off-speed pitches better. This is a 1-0 pitch. Off-speed breaking ball is in there. Does Heinkel, Heinkel to you, Bob, have an odd-looking delivery? It's got like a hitch in it or a pause in it. It looks like it'd be a, a very herky-jerky, deceptive motion to the hitter. Let's watch him as he comes to the plate out of the stretch. Checks Lions. And that one's blocked by Pena. Play at third end. Not the chance. And what a bad play. That is an awful play by a slow-footed catcher in that situation. And Pena threw him out. Lyons shaking his head. He knows he pulled a rock. Two outs, Lyons on second base. The eighth place hitter up Elster. And before Barry Lyons reached the point of no return, halfway between second and third, he knew he'd made a bad mistake. He did not have to be told that. Pena from the knees blocks it well. Shows still an outstanding throwing arm. A bad mistake by Lyons. When he entered the Met dugout, the first guy to greet him, though, was Gary Carter. Gave him a pat on the back. Mets with three catchers. They've also got Mackie Sasser. They can use late in the ball game. Fastball high to Brunanski to start the Cardinal second. In the first inning, Gooden threw a high total of pitches. Not unusual for a power pitcher coming out of the bullpen. He could not control his fastball, Bob, but he had some great curveballs that he threw when he needed them. Like that. I mean, it is just amazing what he has done since being a, really a thrower the minor leagues his first year or two 95 miles an hour now the finesse pitch has come along the change up and we've seen some great curves get hard to third comes up nicely from Magadan across the diamond and Hernandez handles the low throw now let's take a look at Whitey Herzog's lineup a last minute change as Ozzie Smith was reactivated just before the game Tim Jones was going to start at second and Okendo at short, but now with Ozzie in there, Pendleton moves from second to third in the order. Guerrero moves down from third to the cleanup spot. So you improve yourself at shortstop, second base, Okendo moving there, and offensively with Ozzie in the two spot. Ozzie and Willie McGee are the two guys who really hit good and well on this team for Whitey Herzog. Each better than 300 lifetime against the dock. Another chance for Magadan. Two quick outs in the St. Louis second. You think Davey Johnson doesn't have a bench strength? Remember coming out of spring training, Bob, he was saying he didn't think he was deep enough at certain positions. I mean, he's got so many players, I don't know what he's going to do. And Howard Johnson hits 30 home runs a year and steals bases and on the bench. A Mookie Wilson he can bring off. Mazzilli, still a reliable pinch hitter. Keith Miller in the minor leagues. And David West, the left-hander at Tidewater. Mark Carrion, when he gets off the disabled list, it's a very deep team. Okendo at 167 in the early going. Johnson told me before the game that it's likely Howard Johnson will play tomorrow at third base when Jose De Leon pitches for St. Louis. He felt that the early season cold weather the Mets encountered at home against the Cards and then this past weekend on the road in Pittsburgh compounded Hojo's problems with his throwing. He had difficulty getting loose. He wasn't getting a lot of chances at third. And then when he did have to throw across the diamond, the combination of pressing and thinking about it, aiming the ball, and not being loose in the cold weather did him in. And all those trade rumors swirling around about him. Four-way deals and three-way deals for Langston, and I think that upset him. This is the guy that Doc does not want to lose for an obvious reason. The eighth-place hitter, you walk him, Pitcher comes up, and you got your leadoff hitter starting off the next inning, so he wants to go after this guy. Goes to the fastball. It's hammered down to first, and Hernandez does it himself. 
after a shaky first Gooden retires the Cardinals in order in the second we'll be back after this from your local station the sports Emmy Awards Sunday at 2 30 so those arch rivals the Cardinals and Mets are at it again in years when the Cardinals have prevailed the race has been close and so is the head-to-head -head competition in the years when the Mets have won the National League East they've done it easily the Cardinals have fallen back and been under 500 and the Mets have dominated head-to-head 12-6 -head, and 14-4 Elster was at bat when Lyons was thrown out he swings on the first pitch here and here's Ozzy operating again well Dr. London who's been around a long time Gene Gizem on the trainer said four to six weeks that's what it'll take that's the history of coming back from the ribcage ball Ozzy took hitting yesterday fielded well today and hit again and they said well he'll probably play at 80 percent this looks like 80 percent mm. is he quick Ozzy of course sets the standard for shortstop play but the guy he just threw out Kevin Elster if he goes through today without making an error will establish a National League record for consecutive errorless games at shortstop dating back to last year Elster has gone 68 without booting one tied Buddy Kerr a Mets scout now and he's got Eddie Brinkman's to go which is 72 for the major league record the interesting thing about that play by Ozzie who just robbed Kevin Elster of a base hit was it was an off-speed pitch and Ozzie was leaning to his right and the right-handed hitter will usually pull it and yet he recovered and still covered all the ground to his left and made an off-balance throw right. and you can only do that with great quickness you were talking before about what a good hitter Dwight Gooden is that's true of most of the Mets starters especially Darling and Gooden and it's sometimes overlooked you take that ninth spot for granted but the Mets probably win a handful of games over the course of a season. He didn't go around on that one because perhaps a pitcher can be left in an extra inning or two when he's still pitching well. You don't have to pinch hit. They help themselves out with a hit or get the sacrifice bunt down. Well, that's it. Is if you're a good hitter, it usually shows up in your bunting too. Ooh. Two and two as the fastball just missed. Pena had a little conversation right now with Dutch Renner. Thought that they had the outer part of the plate. Heichel's got to have generally pretty good control. Set up that fork ball, move the fastball around. Here's a ball whacked toward the gap in left center, but Milt Thompson is there as it dies, and he makes the catch. I'm not sure you lose an awful lot with Willie Mickey out defensively and Milt Thompson in defensively different styles Thompson plays a little more shallow Willie plays deeper but he can go get the ball also Dykstra advances to the plate last night Mookie Wilson played center field went three for five with a home run Pendleton and Guerrero come up close at the corners in case he tries to drop a bunt down and if you have trouble hitting off-speed pitches, Dykstra loves fastballs. Your chance of seeing that fork ball, which is an easier pitch to bunt. There's that strength up the middle, folks. There's not a better defense in baseball than this Cardinals when they're healthy. Ozzy, not this time. <laughs> you really got to be careful, don't you? You called too quickly that guy out there. <laughs> I, I mean, really, you, you see the ball, he'd say base set, and yet he comes close to almost everything in his area. Strawberry had a base set in the first inning, a bullet up the middle, and Ozzie dove and came inches from getting it. I mean, hard hit balls, and he's right there. The, it's a sixth sense. Try and teach it. Try and talk about it, and you can't. And yet Whitey Herzog will not, not, not let an Ozzie Smith coach his minor league middle infielders because he's so unorthodox. Won't let him near him. Be like letting a Roberto Clemente or yeah. a Yogi Berra coach your hitters. It works for them, but not for everybody. Now you'd want an Elster or a Trammel to teach because fundamentally they do things in a proper way. Yeah, they're classic. Ozzy's the stylist. Maybe there was a way of saying it in a few words than I just tried. <laughs> I 
Dykstra away from first with two down in the third. No score. Heinkel works to Jeffries. Now here's where you see Heinkel with speed on and Dykstra at first base has to adjust or decoy, forcing that fork ball in with his glove. He may force it in to make it look like it, and if the base stealer sees it, he says, hey, he can't throw over very quickly with a fork ball grip. And you try and pick the fork ball pitch also. It's down sometimes in the dirt, which gives you the extra couple of steps. There he goes. Oh, and what a jump. Off-speed pitch. Good one to run on. He steals it easily. I mean, by the time Heinkel let the ball go, it looked like Lenny had three or four steps on it. And there was a pleasant sight as he gets rid of the tobacco. You talk to any female <laughs> baseball fan and their major objection to the sport. You talk to a guy who says, I don't like AstroTurf, I don't like Dome Stadiums, the designated hitter. But you talk to most ladies who watch baseball, and the thing they have trouble with is guys chewing and spitting and certain adjustments that players make during the course of the game. Well, like Geraldo Rivera, Morton Donnie Jr., you can turn them off if you don't like them. I guess you're going to turn a ball game off, too, couldn't you? But then they'd miss your comments. Hmm. Two and one now to Jeffries. Greg Jeffries, someday, is going to be an ideal number three hitter. Switch hitter with some power. The reason he's hitting second is because Davey Johnson doesn't have a two-hitter. This guy makes contact, puts the ball in play. Easy chance for Okendo. Room service, hop, and that'll do it. No runs, a hit. A stolen base and a man left. Scoreless tie at Bush. Gooden has always been a fast starter. 15 and 2 in the season's opening month. A strike at the knees to Heinkel. Last year, Gooden was 8 and 0 at one point, went 10 and 9 the rest of the way to finish 18 and 9. 0 and 2. Heinkel's first major league at bat. Talk about a daunting experience. First time with the stick at this level. And it's Gooden he's staring at. They check at third. He didn't go. One and two. Heinkel heard it. He didn't see it. He almost tried to run into that ball. He hasn't seen Dwight's curveball yet. It has been very effective to the regular hitters in the Cardinal lineup. Now he does. Oh, that isn't fair. He throws three laser beams up there and then gets him with a curve in the dirt. And the thing about Doc is that he has very the speed on this curveball already. This is a little bit harder one. Kill a couple worms. Some more impressive numbers on Doc. He's got eight complete games in his April career so far. Three shutouts. It's like he's from the old school. So many pitchers come out of spring training these days don't go nine in spring training. Some go six and seven only. Very few managers push their pitchers that hard in the spring these days. Some of that because of the relief specialist, specialists, of course. But Earl Weaver used to have his pitchers come out of spring training, almost all of them having gone nine innings. And those days are all but gone. The 0-1 to Coleman. Thinks about a bunt. And he committed himself 0-2. Paul Rungi down at third as Dutch Renner checked with him, much to the displeasure of the big crowd in St. Louis. In the All-Star game in the Big A, California, his father, Mr. Rungi, umpired that last All-Star game. Their extra innings with a lot of strikeouts. Paul's dad, Ed Rungi. Still active. Community relations, I believe, with the San Diego Padres. That was the marathon all-star oh, game back in 67. Madeline which... Mays pinch hit, and they both got called out on strike by his father. Tony Perez finally won it with a homer off Catfish Hunter. <gasps> One and two. There is a little something different about Dwight Gooden's delivery now. Watch the follow-through to get what they call extension. 
Davy Johnson and Mal Stottlemyre this spring got some tapes of him when he was called up for Davy's team in Triple A ball. Remember, he had the big strikeout numbers. They felt he wasn't following through as much in the last year or two and was throwing more straight up. So they've got him a little more what they call a cup, a little more leg action, drive from the back leg, and reaching out to try and add a little more velocity, which he doesn't need. Perspiration glistening off the Doc's face. Out of play. The temperature is only in the high 60s, but the sun is warm down on that artificial surface field at Bush Stadium. A little different than Wrigley Field last week, isn't it? Boy, was it chilly, and the snow eventually started falling. It holds at two and two. Gooden's record has always been better at night than in the daytime. Outstanding under any circumstances, but under the lights, He's 63 and 20 lifetime with a 2.20 ERA. Almost invincible. Still two and two. In day games, now remember, we're still talking about winning two out of every three, but the ERA is a more human 3.48. Well, you talk April any other month, or you talk day and night, he's can be devastating almost all times a year, but he's got a little of that monkey on his back when it comes to postseason play, but he's still very young, just 24. Liner through the middle, and it will drop. Once again, the man they want on, and this is going to be quite a matchup again, Bob. The Mets have never thrown this guy out. A lot of streaks working in today's game. We told you about Elster. McReynolds has stolen 33 straight over two seasons, and Coleman has never been thrown out by a Met catcher. Bluffs the go, they pitch, pitch out. out. The thing about it with Ozzie up there, back in the lineup, he's got such great back control. He can do one of two things. He can take two strikes and let Vince go, or... If Doc tries to unload in a hurry and throw a fastball, he can turn and pop it. So you, you got to be very careful with Ozzy up there. He's become a pretty good offensive player. The Mets' problems are compounded here because Gooden has always been relatively easy to run against. Last year, 84% of the runners who tried to steal against Gooden were successful. He's a little slow coming out of the set, although he has improved since he first broke in. Right there, he speeded up his delivery just a little bit. Instead of the high left leg kick, he went to a little bit more of a glide step to try and give Barry Lyons a chance. But again, what happens is you lose sight of the most important guy, and that's the guy with the bat in his hand. And now he's behind him 2-0. Gary Carter's done pretty well in terms of throwing out would-be base stealers, but Coleman swiped one against Carter last night. Not going, and it's hit foul. Jim Riggleman, the new first base coach. Nick Leva had coached third. He moved over to the Phillies, becoming the youngest manager in the major leagues. And Whitey Herzog sent Rich Hacker from the first base coaching lines to third. And Riggleman came up from the minor league system. You can see how smart Ozzy was on that last pitch, even though he fouled it off. 2-0 and ahead in the count. He sees the gap between Jeffries and Hernandez, and he tried to shoot it through the gap and pull it that direction. Get a first and third. He's, He's going. going. And he'll have to come back. 2-2. Two and two. I don't know if there's a more fun team to watch play baseball than the Cardinals. Yes, last year and many other years they've had trouble scoring runs. With Bernanski and Guerrero's bat and when Willie comes back, I think it'll change. And Whitey Herzog, the way he squeeze bunts, safety, suicide squeeze, hit and runs, great base stealers. If there's any better than buddy better than him, I don't know who it is. A few in his class, mm. but there's no higher league. He's going. And it's hit right through the hole, vacated by Elson. 
faster as he went to cover. What a gorgeous piece of hitting by Ozzie. at the corners with one out. Bobby, you fight so hard as a shortstop not to leave your position too soon in a hit and run. But with Ozzie, because he can wait so long with the short, quick swing, you can't wait to the last split second like you do with a big swing. It almost looked like he placed it through there. I doubt it. Two and two off the of Dwight Gooden, but it sure looked like it had the eyes and placement. Ozzie's so. going on the first pitch to Pendleton. A ground ball to second base. They can't come home. Coleman too swift. The Cardinals have the lead. And Ozzie at second as Pendleton is thrown out. his personal excellence in the field and the little things he can do at the plate. The Cardinals for the last four or five years have always been a Swiss watch kind of team offensively. You take one component out of that lineup and it throws everything off. Well, it's like you just hit running Ozzy. Now, Ozzy, this team knows how to make outs, and that's very important. Ozzy made an out the first time up, getting Coleman to third base. Didn't score the run. This time, Pendleton sees the infield back, started running. He's got to hit the ball on the ground somewhere. He made an out and got an RBI. It's all moving base runners in simple terms. Herrera walked in the first. Hit hard, comes up easily for Elster. He keeps his errorless streak intact. But the Cardinals break through. They lead Gooden and the Mets 1-0 after three in St. Louis. Strawberry, McReynolds, and Hernandez will be the hitters against Heinkel in the fourth. As you see, they're having trouble getting untracked. Believe me, no one in the National League thinks anything like this is going to last long. The straw man takes the ball. And those batting averages don't tell the entire story. They have left so many men in scoring position early in the season, of course. Darrell singled up the middle in the first. The breaking ball is popped behind the plate, and Pena has room. And he had a good breaking ball in his zone. Up, out over the plate. May have pulled off it a little too soon. He worked with Bill Robinson before the game down in the cage underneath the stands, trying to keep his weight shift back. He feels he's been lunging, and he's got a long swing to start with, not as long as when he first came up. He has shortened, and he's trying to get even more compact. But this whole offense still revolves around that guy. McReynolds' first pitch swinging into shallow right. Okendo calls. And before Hernandez steps into the batter's box, let's check what's happening elsewhere as we go to Marv Albert in New York. Marv? Thank you, Bob. In L.A., in the third inning, it was Mike Marshall with a man on, connecting for his third home run of the season. And the Dodgers, behind Oral Hershiser, lead the Astros 3-0 now, bottom of the fourth inning. Let's get back to Bob and Tony. All right, Marv, speaking of Hershiser, the guy at the plate, Keith Hernandez, told me a while back that as great as Hershiser was last year, he was not as intimidating to face, at least from Hernandez's perspective, in the postseason, as Mike Scott had been for the Astros in 86. Now, the figures show that Hernandez is one who's always hit Hershiser well, so maybe he's looking at it simply from a personal perspective. But he thought that Scott was in even a greater groove in 86 than Hershiser was last year for the Dodgers. Well, you're talking about a couple different kinds of pitchers. I mean, Scott can overpower you with that split finger. You swing at the ball in the dirt sometimes. Hershiser isn't all finesse because he throws harder than people think, but they're different. Oh. 
this is the guy who really has been the linchpin in terms of the emotions here in St. Louis. It wasn't just that the Cards and Mets emerged as contenders and were always battling. It was the switch of this guy from one uniform to the next. Right center field and hit very well. Milt Thompson after it won't get there. One hop against the wall. It's stuck underneath that cage and a speedier man might have had a triple. But Hernandez stops with a two-base hit. And Keith has to be a little careful after he tore that hamstring up and missed a good part of the season last year. And when you have that with his age, and he's never been a great runner, you're going to play a little more carefully. There's that little overhang basket that keeps the fans from reaching onto the field and interfering with a ball in play. And the ball bounced up and hit the underside of that, which delayed Milt Thompson's attempt to get it. But it was a moot point since Hernandez was not thinking triple. And he's smart enough to know with two outs, you, one of the cardinal rules, you never make the first or the third out, as Barry Lyons did earlier, at third base. And Keith's got that in mind and know that Magadan, the left-hander, RBI threat should be behind. So those things as he was running the bases were going through his mind. He's that smart. One nothing cards in the fourth. Magadan, good enough to play regularly for some teams. Hit 318 in limited duty at 87, then 277 a year ago. Two and up. Well, the players will tell you, individual Mets, that it is frustrating in this organization when David West gets sent down or Keith Miller and the players who don't play regularly here. But in a way, Frank Cashin who runs the ball club has created such a competition that the players exert themselves a little harder and play better because of their competitive nature because of that competitiveness. Competing for jobs, it's something that since all the expansions is not quite as intense these days. Heinkel works to him. Got it in at the knees, two and one. What a situation for Heinkel. I talked with him before the game in the clubhouse. And he said he's trying to block out the extraneous factors. The fact that in his first start for the Cardinals, he's facing Dwight Gooden. It's on national television. He's new to the big leagues relatively, but he's 29 years old. Spent a lot of time knocking around. A bright young man, mature player. So he's unlikely to be overcome by what appears to be the import of the situation. Stay well, within I, himself. Yeah, I would think he would tell you that he spent, it was a lot more pressure and about 10 bucks a day meal money and about $10,000 salary pitching in the minor leagues all those years than it is up here. Minor league free agents spend his six years in the minors. One of those guys you don't judge by a radar gun. Mm -hmm. This is a 3-1 pitch. And the count runs out full. Heinkel has found himself in minor league outposts like Bristol, Tennessee, Glen Falls, New York, Nashville, Evansville, and most proudly, last year, briefly, he wore the uniform of the Toledo Mudhens. Huh. A team for whom you once coached first base. I did, and they lost both games of the doubleheader <laughs> as a result. <laughs> Here's the payoff. Walking. But that might have been a semi-strategic walk. You've got the right-handed hitter, Lyons, coming up. Magadan is dangerous, and he's the kind of hitter that handles the Henkel-type pitcher pretty well, a breaking ball pitcher. And really, to me, that is not a good way for Magadan to approach that at bat. He had two pitches in that series that were up that he could have hit, and yet it looked like he'd rather have taken the walk and leave it up to the next guy, the right-handed hitter. And sometimes that's not a wise thing to do. Outside the Lions. Well, Magadan is a lot like his fellow Tampa resident, Wade Boggs. In fact, he's patterned himself after Boggs as a hitter. Very disciplined. When's he has he a certain strike zone. When's he at 360 for a whole season or two or three or four? Although he's been a low 300 hitter in the Lions. I know what you mean. This is a 1 0 pitch. Swerves outside again.
Of course, this graphic is based on early season returns. They've only played three games, of which the Mets have won two. But these games are more important to both these clubs, especially the Cardinals, than you might think. The April games between St. Louis and the Mets usually have established the character of the race and the character of the rivalry in the last few years. In the years when Davey Johnson's team has won it, they pounced on the Cardinals in April and broken their spirit early. Three and oh. What do you think, Bob, what happens when you play a team that can be so dominant as the Mets? You play almost every game, whether they're the Pirates or the Cardinals or Montreal, those who they say might be contenders, as if it's the seventh game of the World Series. And you end up burning yourself all after 162. Elster's on deck. Rick Pittsburgh beat him a game. It was like the seventh game of the World Series celebration because they played the arrogant Mets. Perceived as arrogant. Walked him on four pitches. Mm. He can't afford that. Michael, his control's off now. He's got to try and go after hitters and spot the fastball. And it's always easier said than done. They say you're, you're a little bit of a nibbler and you miss inside of the plate and you get killed. And he's got to retouch the corners up. Whitey's going to have to get more offense this year because his pitching staff will you know, get last year all the injuries to it. And again this year. Uh, Mets have the bases loaded with two out for Elster. Elster hit 310 at Tidewater in 87. And then barely over 200 last year. In the spring, he concentrated on abandoning a long lengthy kind of home run swing and getting back to the more compact swing which had worked for him in the minors. A breaking ball is hit into shallow center field. Thompson started back. Now comes in. Oh, and out goes wow. Okendo to that? make a fantastic catch. Wow. Some have said he's a better shortstop than Ozzie which is hard to believe because of his throwing arm. What a remarkable play as Thompson was frozen off these white shirts in the background in a sunny day and took a step back couldn't recover. And Okendo picked him up with the bases loaded. Oh boy. Aside from the pitcher's mound, more ball games are lost or won around second base. And a lot of middle infielders don't make the play when it counts. There's a guy right there who replaced Tim Jones, a late starter, moving to second base for short because Ozzie played. Makes a great play to save at least two runs. No telling what would have happened on a high bounce. He really picked up his pitcher after two walks and picked up the center fielder after he got a bad jump. So the one nothing Cardinal lead is preserved. A ball and a strike to Milt Thompson. Fouled it off his foot. He has started the season like a house ablaze. 11 for his first 23. Three for four last night, so they haven't really felt the absence of Willie McGee that badly. A little harder breaking ball that Thompson gets on top of. You saw a good reason why well, you should wear a guard on that front foot like so many players do. And Whitey was lamenting in the dugout before the game. He said, Willie McGee is the only player I know who can show up at the park after two rainouts and be hurt. strike three and Thompson makes a right turn and heads back to sit next to Whitey. You know Whitey before the ball game I know you saw him too was sitting with one of the best right hand hitters I ever saw in old St. Louis Brown for Roy Seaver. Whitey had a little chance for the Roger Miller's golf tournament up in North Dakota. And the cancer Institute up there but Seaver wore that guard in his foot and he was rookie of the year and Whitey then played with him later. He hadn't fallen on his shoulder. Seaver would be one of the all time great right hand hitters. And into Bernanski for ball one. There's a, a pitch for Doc and postponed Ray and the Yankees, the Minnesota Twins. But he is having trouble with his fastball, so they're starting to sit on his curveball, which is the pitch he's been able to get over. So he's got to say, if I can't throw my fastball for a strike, I'm going to use it for a purpose. Move him off the plate so they can't sit on my curve. Because that's been his most effective pitch so far. And that shows you how good he is. Doesn't need his fastball to keep in the ballgame. Hey, how about Bobby Valentine's Rangers? 
What's that, 9-1 and one now as they beat Detroit? The Ushers' pulse has jumped. That one nearly clipped him. Bobby Valentine's Rangers, how about Nolan Ryan? Hardly pitched in the screen, strikes out 15 Brewers. One and two to Bernanski. Got him. For Gooden, that's strikeout number four. You know, when Whitey was remarking Riley about McGee's injuries, that was not to indicate that Willie isn't a gamer. He plays hard when he's in there. But, but Willie is an amusing fellow who often finds himself in unusual circumstances. And in fact, during batting practice, he pulled a thigh muscle on a night when the game was rained out. Pena, ground ball to Jeffries. Up with it cleanly. Gooden sets him down in order in the fourth. Still 1-0 Cardinals. And we'll be back after these messages from your local stations. Tomorrow, the Jeep Superstars competition continues on Sports World. Carl Lewis, Matt Biondi, Lenny Dykstra of the Mets, Evander Holyfield, and other greats test their athletic abilities to determine the best in sport. The Jeep Superstars at 4.30 Eastern on Sports World. The only reason he's got a chance for any of those other guys is because Bo Jackson probably wasn't a competitor. I saw Bo opening day in Kansas City do something that I've never seen. Maybe Matt will try it and did it, but he had a hard hit ground ball on the turf to Mosby in center field, and Mosby was picking it up, and Bo Jackson slid into second base. It was just incredible. He's making coaches obsolete with that world-class speed. He is fun to watch play. It sounds a little bit like the cool Papa Bell story. Yeah. Hit a line nice. drive through the box, and it hit me in the backside when I slid into second. I thought you were going to tell a light switch story. You sure these aren't apocryphal? <laughs> no, I was there. I saw Bo do it. 0-2 to Gooden. We told you that the Mets, as a staff, have good hitting pitchers. To back it up, there were only 20 pitchers in the National League with 10 or more base hits last year. All five members of the Mets starting rotation were among that group. All five of them had at least 10. This one's rolled toward the middle. Ozzie's there. Gooden made it close. They talk about Ozzie's quick hands. Well, it's all in the feet, folks. He was shuffling those feet to get in position before the ball hit his glove. He does so many unusual things. Rich Hacker, coach, was hitting ground balls to him, trying to hit him as hard as he could when he was up close to quicken his reflexes, and then hitting high choppers on the turf so Ozzie could play off hops. Everybody wants a good hop. He plays off hops so well. Ozzie won another gold glove, of course, last year, despite the fact that he made a career-high 22 errors. And a lot of those were throwing, and remember, Whitey Herzog used 11 different first basemen last year. And Whitey said if Guerrero had been at first base with his soft hands, and he's got good hands, so Ozzie would have maybe made half the total. But most of them were on throws, Ozzie having some shoulder problems. And so a lot of them were catchable. Short hops could have been scooped out and worked. You think Guerrero's that good at first base? Well, I'm not saying he's agile with his knees, but he's got good hands. I mean, when he plays... So he's good first, receiving throws, but oh, yeah. not playing grounders. Oh, no, he's had a bad knee, and we all know that. He's a, in a brace from that slide in Florida a few years ago. But I don't think his problem for Tommy Lasorda at third was ever that he couldn't catch ground balls. It was just that he couldn't get to them and lacked the agility because of the knee and then the back problems. He's got good hands. sitting next to Ozzy in the clubhouse. They lock her alongside one another, and Ozzy said, boy, I'm not used to being on the disabled list. Pete said, I'll tell you all about the DL. Mm -hmm. Spent half my life there. Left field, Coleman glides back. Second baseman, Greg Jeffrey. Scoreless game at Candlestick in the sixth. And the Dodgers behind Hershiser, leading the Astros at home. <laughs> Jeffries fouls it out of play. The switch hitter is just 21 years old, retains rookie status, 
He hit 321 with six homers in 109 at bats toward the end of last year and then hit over 300 in the playoffs against the Dodgers. But he didn't have quite enough appearances to lose the rookie standing. So he could win the award this year. Talking to a couple of National League advanced scouts here, Don Scala, advanced scouts for Pittsburgh, Hank King from Philadelphia, they said this kid's a hard kid to scout because his swing is like a mirror image from the right and left side, almost exactly the same. And they can't find blind spots ordinarily. And not always the case. They say a left-handed hitter from switching is a low ball hitter, right hand is a high ball hitter. That's not always the case, but it's a general rule. And they both said that they're having difficulty with this kid because of his bat control and trying to find holes in the swing. I don't know if it's inside, outside, breaking ball. I mean, he, the mental part of his game is so good at his age. And a lot of guys have the mechanics and the hand-eye coordination, but the, he has an idea about hitting. Heinkel comes to the plate one and two. Just off the outside corner. And the reason Jeffries at this point doesn't walk a lot is because when he swings, he usually puts the ball in play. And that's a terrific bat control with some power. Off the fist, and Brunanski is camped under it. So Heinkel, the Wichita State product, who spent six years in the minors, just trying to find a home somewhere in the major leagues, is in front of Dwight Gooden as we go to the last half of the fifth. It's 1-0 St. Louis. You know, some of these fans come to the park and they think they can get themselves on television through an obvious device like bringing attention to the announcers. And it works 100% of the time. There's a Bruno bear right there. Can I ask you to get a cut on those? Little shadow creeping over home plate now. I don't think it's of any effect to hitters now, but as it creeps across a little farther, Doc should become more effective. Keep forgetting about Heinkel. He's not doing a bad job either. Okendo kept the 1 0 Cardinal mm -hmm. lead intact with a sparkling play an inning ago. He's back to the plate on an Elster blooper with the bases loaded and two out. Roll to Jeffries. Okendo is gone. Jeffries played third base last night. Every other start so far this year has been at second. We're going to have two good teachers on the pivot. We want to have Buddy Harrelson and Davey Johnson, and that's who coached him all spring. Started out not feeling comfortable there because he did like that runner coming up from behind him on the pivot. You can see him at shortstop. Bobby Ojeda in the middle. Mel Stottlemyre to the left. And of course, that's Davey Mel's kid, Todd, has scored his baseball his last four outings for the Toronto Blue Jays in relief. If Heinkel can last a couple more innings, give Mike Rourke and Whitey Herzog six or seven strong innings. What a plus it would be because the starting rotation is obviously the weak point of this ball club. When they get everybody healthy, Willie McGee back, they have a pretty good day-to-day -day lineup and with the speed that they have, plus the punch in Guerrero and Bernanski, they should be able to score runs. But they're not going to get Cox back this year and the, the jury's still out on Matthews who has right. shoulder and elbow problems. To set what Whitey Herzog is up against, with Cox disabled, nobody in the present Cardinal rotation Here's the one-two pitch. Michael gets a piece of it, bounces it toward the middle. Jeffries behind second base. Oh, Got him as Hernandez picked it up. That's an E4, if not for that guy, who has set the standard at first base. Gil Hodges was outstanding. Vic Powers was fantastic, I thought. But Keith has added that extra dimension. Not only is he such a good feeling first baseman and so aggressive he's a leader because he's like having a manager on the field and he gets a hop that is not an easy one. 11 consecutive gold gloves for Hernandez. I wonder how many percentage points he's worth to a team's fielding average. Not just the balls he gets. But the errors he saved as we just saw. And he can make a bad throwing infield a good throwing infield. Coleman has a walk, a single, and a stolen base. That's a strike. You know, Hernandez's presence, even if he has tapered off a little bit, is so important now because the Met infield is unsettled. Howard Johnson with the throwing problems at third. Jeffries played third last night, Maggot and today. Jeffries learning a new position at second base. Elster, of course, is terrific at short. He never makes a bad throw. 
Kevin. On one. Did he offer at it? No. To complete what I started to say before, with Cox on the disabled list, no present member of the Cardinal rotation has ever won more than 13 games in a season. Whereas every Met starter has won at least 16 at one time or another. You don't have the toolbox, you can't build a house. And that might be what Herzog is up against. And the way Don Ossie threw the ball in spring training, and of course McDowell has struggled a little bit, Don Ossie adds to the depth of their pitching staff. And he can help you out from the right side before you get to Randy Myers. And Davey Johnson has a guy like Leach who went 10-0 and in one stretch in 87. Aguilera, who certainly would be in the starting rotation of almost any other team in baseball. Well, I think Whitey, Whitey Buck Rogers, Montreal, Jimmy Little know that they've got to play perfect baseball if they can. It's going to be hard for Pittsburgh with God out, their closer. This one is blooped behind third base. And it's on the line. It hit the chalk. Bounces into the Met bullpen. And Coleman will stop at second. He's been on base three times now. Now well, they were playing him away, playing him shallow, and yet he still found a hole. If the guy in left doesn't get it, nobody's going to be because no one plays that spot better than Kevin McReynolds. He's a center fielder, really by trade, and can still play there for a lot of other clubs. not necessarily a good play now with two out but Coleman of course is a threat to steal third in many circumstances he swiped third 23 times last year and with this team with two outs you'll do it because they get so many infield hits and you know with Ozzy up he beats the ball in the dirt if you're on second and he beats out first and third but if you can steal third or get there on a short wild pitch pass ball it puts so much more pressure on this turf on the infielders that's why Whitey lets him go no matter what the score is. Even the third with two outs, which was always a no-no years ago. The 1-0 pitch to Ozzie Smith. Good in his 9-4 lifetime against St. Louis, including a victory on opening day at Shea Stadium this year. Pedro Guerrero touched him for a three-run homer, but other than that, Gooden was strong. Then in his next outing, he pitched eight terrific innings before handing the ball to Randy Myers, who struck out the side in Montreal to close it in the ninth. So he's 2-0. Oh. There he goes for third. The throw, not in time. He's got the green light at all times, even with the left-handed hitter up. And now what happens is just what we said, Ozzy, because there's two strikes, he's not going to drop the bunt down. But, yeah, it's interesting because even though it's two strikes, Magadan played back at third, and then Davey Johnson moved him in. Let's see if this one stays in. Magadan runs out of room. Doc Gooden, the first, that pitch to Smith. First one with Coleman on third. Went from a windup. When you do that, you give Coleman a little bit bigger lead. And then he bounces a breaking ball. Coleman will try and score it. Well, there are 13 ways you can score from third base. I'm not going to list them all. Balks and infield hits and errors and all at all. Boy, Wills taught me that years ago. Of course, he was a great base dealer, and he listed them all. And boy, it really puts pressure on the B. Up high with the fastball, two and two. Coleman at third, two out, last half of the fifth. Cardinals got a run in the third inning. And Don Heinkel has made it stayed up, st uh, stand up. It's one nothing. Good. Nice play, and that'll do it. Ozzie just tried to slap that one through the middle. But the Doc stuck the glove out and made the play. Still one nothing. On 
Andre Dawson and the Cubs have won seven of their first nine. Mitch Williams doing the job out of the bullpen. Many of you will see them take on these same New York Mets next week. Tony and I will be at County Stadium in Milwaukee, the Tigers, and the Brewers. What our fans should do is take a look at this. He's been in shape, folks. It's nice and swelt. Next week, he goes to Milwaukee for a Bob Costas ballpark pig out. You can't <laughs> believe what this guy's going to eat. Hey, you got to get that bratwurst sprout. with red sauce. Oh, it's, you're disgusting when you get there. Talk about clogging one's arteries. Oh. Well, you know, you take a look at what's happening at Candlestick and in San Diego where they're serving sushi <laughs> yeah. and all kinds of wimp ballpark food. You become a salivating simp when you go to Milwaukee. Oh. Yeah. oh! One and one, the count to Strawberry. Top half of the six. No runs on four hits for New York. One, three and oh for the Cardinals. Heichel generally has moved the ball pretty well. He walked the two Magadan and Lions in the fourth, and Okendo picked him up, but he's... Boy, the off-speed pitch is hit hard to right. It might get out of here. This game's tied on Strawberry's first home run of the year. I do believe he hung a fourth ball. The straw man likes the ball down when he can get it. Not that he won't hit a pitch up and away to center left center field, but then it looked like it was inside part of the plate. Mid-thigh high. So the extra work with Bill Robinson before the game today, underneath the stand, seems to have paid off. There's Bill. You say what you want about Strawberry, and he's been involved in more than his share of controversies. But he's more than a great player statistically. He has presence that few big league ball players have. Where he moves, the spotlight moves with him. And he has worked harder at his feeling this spring than any other year. Bill Robinson said, hey, you want to be the complete player? You want to have people stop booing you? Work on your defense, too. Now McReynolds stings one. Coleman cuts it off on the warning track, might hold him to a long single, and he does. In this game today, you have two of the best left fielders in the business when it comes to going to the line and holding the potential extra base hit to a single on a ball like that. McReynolds is very good at it, and we just saw Coleman. The unfriendly reception once again for Hernandez. Somebody's going to start throwing now in the Cardinal bullpen. Looks like John Costello. Ken Daly, left-hander. Costello, the right-hander. A good situation for Keith Hernandez. Not an overpowering pitcher here on the mound. A guy who is pullable. The hole open with Guerrero. Holy McReynolds, a base stealer on. Artificial surface, tough for Guerrero to cover ground, and we'll see if Keith can create a first and third. He's going to be trying to head an account to hook the ball to the right. McReynolds is leading. Remember, Heinkel was a reliever last year for Sparky Anderson's Tigers. He did start some games in winter ball several months ago, but he's still got to disprove the rap on him that he's basically a five-inning pitcher. First two hitters here in the sixth have stung the ball. Gone. There goes McReynolds. And Ozzie can't get back to it. McReynolds jumps over the prone Cardinal shortstop as he advances to third on the single by Hernandez. So Ozzie did exactly the same thing to Elster earlier in the game, singling on the hit and run. And this time he was unable to reverse himself and flag the hard hit shot by Hernandez. And what a great guessing game and execution by Keith Hernandez because he got an off-speed pitch, a pitch that you would probably be more likely to pull. And so Ozzie was covering and tried to hold his ground as long as he could and still looked like he appeared to get a glove on it. And Keith, sitting on an off-speed pitch, shoots it the other way. That was smart hitting. He outfoxed not only Peña and Heinkel, but he outfoxed Ozzie Smith, the best in the game. Now the pitching coach, Mike Rourke, is headed for the mound. Hernandez is two for three, a double and a single now. Rourke, of course, was Bruce Souter. May never pitch again, but every time Souter got in trouble with that fork ball, he got on the phone to Mike Rourke. And of course, Heinkel does have that fork ball also. 
as they confer at the mound let's look back at the strawberry homer that tied the game at one leading off here in the sixth look at where Pena is set up he's set up away and you can see where the pitch drifted middle of the plate in right about the knees What Bill Robinson was looking at, that replay, I think, showed it. Bill Robinson was looking at the timing device that Strawberry has, which is his leg kick. He was kind of toppling over and lunging at the ball, so Bill wanted him to kind of go back first, and he would wait a little longer. He waited on that one, didn't he? Magadan now, first and third, nobody out. And a ball from Heinkel. Two right-handed hitters waiting next, Lyons and Elster. When's the last time you see a lineup that uses their fifth hitter, an RBI spot, and usually a power spot to hit and run with? I'll show you the versatility of this lineup. And they can do it with Magadan because he doesn't track out much either and moves the ball around. Even though you don't have a lot of speed on first. It's great defense and uh, you can break up the infield a little bit. This ball is hit softly into right center field, and Milt Thompson can't get there. Makes a skidding attempt. McReynolds trots home. That ties the game. Look Hernandez Pete. heads for third after hesitating. Magadan holds it first with a single, and it's 2-1 New York. And Hernandez just saw him to be a good base runner. You don't have to have great speed because he read the ball off the bat, and he did that before the ball was hit. He saw where the outfielders were playing, and Thompson was playing straight away, maybe even shaded toward left center. Keith was all but on second when he made the long run and trapped it. And he made it a very short run from second to third because of his alertness. That's it. So the call goes to the bullpen. Heinkel gets an ovation. A gutty effort in his first National League start, but he relinquishes the lead here in the sixth. A reminder, we'll be presenting our Rolaids Relief Man Awards during this relief break. Last year, Rolaids Relief Man Awards went to Dennis Eckersley of the Oakland A's in the American League and John Franco of the Cincinnati Reds in the National. We'll be tracking the point standings for this year based on wins, losses, saves and blown saves. Costello makes his third appearance of the year. He came out of nowhere from the minor leagues to do a good job in middle relief last year for Whitey Herzog. Here's the situation he inherits. The Mets have scored twice here. Four consecutive hits. Strawberry homer and then singles by McReynolds, Hernandez and Magadan. First and third. Still nobody out. Lions the hitter. Elster on deck. Infield a double play depth. Ball one inside. And you mentioned earlier on about the impact player that Strawberry is, and that's what he did. He absolutely shocked Heinkel. Boom, he hits a home run. And the next thing you know, by the time the kid, well, not really a kid at 29, collects his thought, they hit and run, they throw more base runners at him. Hit toward the hole to his left Pendleton. He wants to come home. They've got the runner hung up. Look at Keith. He's Hernandez directing traffic. Hard. Now Costello's Hard covering the plate. Hard has messed it up. Hernandez still in the Hard rundown, down. but the Mets wind up with runners at second and third. There is no play in spring training worked on more than defense. First and third situations where you'd like to make just two throws at most. The throw home from Pendleton and then Pena runs him back and you hope you can throw the ball Pena just one extra throw good play by Hernandez look at him directing traffic saying my job is just what I did get in a rundown stay as long as I can to erase the double play situation and so twice he's been pretty smart base runner with not very much speed to say the least going to third base in the ball Thompson because he was alert and now staying with the rundown but the Cardinals really botched it up they usually are so much better fundamentally than that now they'll walk Elster intentionally and bring Gooden to the plate with the bases loaded and one out. A fielder's choice on the last play, of course. 5-2, five, 5-1. Five, so just before Costello came in, we told you about the Rolaids Relief Man Awards. We'll be paying closer attention to that on our telecast this year than in the past for the excellent reason that they're sponsoring the segment. But nonetheless, 
it is interesting for those of you who follow the the fortunes of relief pitchers Mark Davis of San Diego and Mitch Williams over from Texas for Don Zimmer's Cubs each have five saves already every year he's been around Davey Johnson has won 90 games or more twice in his managerial career in the majors he's won over 100 Davey still gets criticized doesn't he said to me before the game we're the only team in baseball where it's impossible to overachieve <laughs> and finally he's resigned himself to the nature of the New York press you lose two or three games in a row and headlines blare about the nosedive you're taking on the back pages of those tabloids and you just have to be able to shake it off in at the corners DP depth up the middle first pitch shallow right Grunansky comes in nobody's going anywhere on this What Davey Johnson did not want, he got. He would have liked to have had a sacrifice fly or a base set, but he did not want a double play. Now White is going to go to his left-hander, Daly, for Dykstra. Herzog goes to the pen, and we go to this break. Darryl Strawberry watching as Ken Daly gets loose. All of you who followed this rivalry remember the monster home run Strawberry hit off daily in the heart-pounding final days of the 1985 race. They went head-to-head -head in the second-to-last series of the season here in St. Louis. The Mets won two of three, but it wasn't good enough, and the Cardinals were able to hold on and win. And in one of those games, Strawberry hit one literally off the clock. It was 10.44 St. Louis time, and he hit one off the digital clock in extra innings to win a game for the Mets. And he burst Heinkel's bubble here in the sixth inning today. Left-handers ordinarily don't touch up. Ken Daly for home runs with that good fastball and very, very good curve. Dykstra now with the bases loaded and two out, and Daly starts him with a strike. In fact... Until Vaughn Hayes, who's been red hot this year, touched him for a home run about a week ago, Daly had not yielded a homer to a left-handed batter in four years since the Strawberry home run. One of those who has made the Tommy John elbow surgery, ligament transplant commonplace. Daly's come back throwing high. Dykstra wants to walk around and clear his head here. Of course... Johnson has the switch hitter Mookie Wilson on the bench and Daly is very tough as you say on left handers that's his specialty so Johnson had the option of inserting Mookie and then leaving him into play center he elects to go with Dykstra there's the Mookster well if you're behind or tie a little bit later in the game you might make the move Daly trying to keep it close cards now trail two to one one and two Let's see if that last pitch, a fastball out of the strike zone, was the, among the series of pitches to try and set up this coming pitch, a breaking ball. Then he is choked up now. He's going to try and put it in play. Look at the crouches there. Bounce it a second. They're out of the inning, and all things considered, Herzog has to be relieved. The Mets get two runs on four hits, and one of them was a homer. Plus, there was an intentional walk mixed in. They leave the bases loaded. It's a one-run game, but this time with the Mets in front. Trailing two to one in the last half of the sixth, the Cardinals will send up Pendleton, Guerrero, and Brunetsky against Gooden, who has allowed them three hits. Looking for his third win without a loss. In the shallow center field, Dykstra comes in. On one pitch, Pendleton is history. They've tried to get Terry Pendleton to hit the ball. Line drives down. He's become a fly ball. 
hitter from the left side in this ballpark that should be taboo. It's interesting with Gooden, I think, and how he has changed since Mel Stoneman, who is a great sinker ball pitcher, has taught him how to sink the fastball because he's got nine ground ball outs in this ball game. There's Mel. Got his son, Mel Jr., triple-A level of Kansas City Royals organization after rotator cuff surgery. Guerrero taking his own sweet time about settling into the box. He's 0 for 1 with a walk. Lifetime, as you see, just 162 against Gooden, but half of those six hits are home runs, including one this year. In for a strike. Interesting how defenses align themselves. You look out at center field. When Ozzie Smith was up last inning, they were playing him in the same spot to full, hitting left-handed. Now Dykstra is playing a power hitter like Guerrero to the opposite field. So they play a little guy to pull, Smith, and they put, play Guerrero, the cleanup hitter, to hit late. He's got tremendous power right center field. And he hits best when he hits in that direction. Not trying to pull everything. Because of all the injuries, which we alluded to earlier, Guerrero hasn't had a 90 RBI season since 1983, when healthy, certainly among the game's most dangerous and productive hitters. And he will get his chances this year if he stays healthy and he'll take it to scoring position for the Cardinals. The hitting conditions are not ideal. You can see by that camera lens how dark it is and good in pitching out of the sun. Did he go around? He did. Strikeout number five for Doc. And you can see how these kind of conditions affect the hitter. I mean, he's had a good curveball, good, and that one bounces. And Guerrero just didn't see it. All you, you cannot pick up the spin on the ball in these conditions. It just comes out as a black object, change of speed, school you, and a hanging curveball becomes effective. I asked Guerrero, what has Gooden usually done against you? And he described that exact pattern. When he's had success, he's gotten ahead of me with heat and then finished me with a breaking ball outside the strike zone and I just couldn't stop. So sometimes knowing what's likely to happen isn't enough. Mm -mm. You can think all you want when you go up against the physical tools of a guy like Gooden. Sometimes you're just overmatched. Look, Rusty Staub, the teams he played for down in Houston, knew exactly when Koufax was going to throw his curveball. And he put one hitters against him. And just such a devastating curveball. He threw so hard. Gooden flags it down. Disposes of Thompson. And another 1-2-3 inning, which will bring us back after these messages from your local station. Strawberry waiting on deck as Jeffries leads off here in the seventh. Try to put what he's done in his first six seasons in perspective. These are the home run totals of the all-time top home run hitters through their first six seasons in the bigs. Ruth's, of course, is low because he started out as a pitcher before shifting to the outfield. Killebrew came on late as well to wind up well over 500. I guess the question you've got to ask is, will Daryl Strawberry have the longevity with these salaries those guys did? And remember, the Aarons and the Mantle, they started in the early, early 20s. In fact, 19 for Mays, and Mantle was up to 19-year-old. Daly starts Jeffries with a strike. So the homer Strawberry hit an inning ago was the 187th of his career. Through six seasons, he had 186, one less than Willie Mays over the same span. But Willie went on to hit 660. And like you say, Tony, the test of greatness is in the long haul. Especially in this game. More so than any other team sport. Jeffries hits it to left. Coleman had him played well and takes it for the first down. This is a game where patience and perseverance and the ability to adapt to changing circumstances are rewarded to a greater extent than in almost any other sport. Here's the home run by the straw man leading off the six off Heinkel. Pitch the Don would like to have had a little bit more outside. And we could see that leg kick and the little adjustment that he made with Bill Robinson.
as Strawberry faces a tough left-hander daily, we might note that last year he hit an extraordinary 20 home runs off left-handed pitching. Something that was somewhat unheard of early in his career. And again, uh, when he tried to pull the ball, caused some problems, and he's begun to realize that he can hit the ball out anywhere. Wait a little bit longer on the breaking ball and slider away from the left-hander, and he can go to center or left center. So more than half of his 39 homers hit off southpaws. Daly behind him 2-0. Oh. Foul back. The folks at the Elias Sports Bureau, the Hurt Brothers, Seymour Sywolf and Company, who annually put out the extraordinary Elias baseball analyst, went and did some checking, trying to put the 20 homers off lefties in context by Strawberry. In 1927, when he hit 60, Ruth hit 19 of them off lefties. Two and two. In 1961, when as your teammate, Roger Maris, hit 61, only 12 of them were against left-handed pitchers. Well, the young slugger from Tampa, Freddie McGriff, from the Toronto Blue Jays last year at 34, and only five were off left-handers. He's already got two this year off left-handers. When you list Strawberry's names with some of the sluggers we just saw, the Aarons and the Mantles and the Mazes and the Robinsons, those guys were much more complete players at that point in their career. Not that Daryl can't because he runs and throws well, but he's never really focused much until pretty much this spring on his defensive abilities. And he is the first to admit that there are times he goes in the fog defensively. Such a mercurial talent, though. And so much fun to watch. You can make a great argument that he should have been the MVP in the National League last year, not Kirk Gibson. Tried to stay back on the changeup, bloops it into shallow center, and Thompson won't get to it. He might get a double out of this. Thompson recovers, whirls and throws, but it's offline, and Strawberry hustling all the way. That's right. He hustled from home plate to first base is where he made that. Instead of, disgustedly, because he did pop it up, jogging down. There's no question Bill Robinson has been a big influence on Strawberry on those kinds of little things. Not a good swing. He was fooled on a little breaking ball. Now he kind of glides in the first gear. He's the kind of guy, though, when he's running well because of those long strides, he doesn't look like he's putting out. And I think that's one of the reasons in the outfield some people say he's nonchalant, yet he's going out. It's just that his long stride fools you. San Francisco pushes, pushes across a run and takes the lead at Candlestick. Hershiser closing in on the shutout at Dodger Stadium. Daly would be the fourth hitter in the bottom of the seventh, so this could possibly be his last inning of work. Ian Costello did a good job in the sixth to keep it close. Boy, through the years, Ken Daly's been such a valuable asset to Whitey Herzog and Mike Rourke, the pitching coach. Getting to their closer, morale, finishing some games himself. Now they're just going to give him the fourth one. The count was 3-0, and and they're not going to mess around with a hitter as dangerous as McReynolds possibly sitting on a certain pitch and burning them so they send him down to first and they'll take their chances with Hernandez. Tony Pena out now with Daryl Strawberry on second having a pretty good look at what the signs are and with Keith. Keith is one of those kinds of players and some don't like him but Keith loves to know where location is like Hernandez talks about I don't have to look back at the catcher. I, said, I feel where he is. I, said, I just feel it. And I said, when I came over and from the Cardinals and Jerry Grody was such a great catcher, said, I finally told Grody, he said, you're tipping off all your pitches. I, said, I can feel you behind her when you move out in location, and I know what you're throwing, and that's why pain is out. To change the sign so Strawberry can't read a location or pitch selection. He swings on the first one, gives it a ride to dead center, but Thompson goes back and takes it over the shoulder. Strawberry tags. He'll go to third with two out. McReynolds holds at first. 
Well, Keith saw enough of those in this ballpark when he played here. Hit the heck out of the ball, and the ball just goes up there and hangs some 410 feet away. That's why this park, the Yankee Stadium, you can really go a little bit along with your pitchers. These, these parks will save your pitching staff over 81 home games because it's so spacious. That 414 is the deepest dimension in the National League. Generally speaking, excuse me, Bob, the National League has bigger ballparks. There are quite a few band boxes in the American League. This is perhaps as good a pitcher's park as there is in baseball. Of course, some of the American League parks are band boxes in terms of where most home runs go, like Fenway or Tiger Stadium, but they open out to deep center field. 440 at Tiger Stadium, mm -hmm. about 420 to dead center yeah, at I'm Fenway. talking about the Seattles and the just Fenway in Detroit, Seattle, and Exhibition Stadium in Toronto, and overall, and the way the ball flies out in right field in Minnesota. It's a power league. This is basically the speed league. Okay, Magadan. Strike one, two. New York has been plagued somewhat again today, getting base hits to break the game open with runners in scoring position. They've had nine base hits. Eichel walked a couple in the fourth. Through six, the Mets have left seven on, and they've got a couple more sitting there. My math correct? If it's not correct, it's at least close. I've got eight, but let's not quibble. They've left a lot on, is the point. One and two. Daly a strike away from stranding a couple more Met runners. Strawberry at third, McReynolds at first, two outs, top of the seventh. 2 1 New York. They've had nine hits. The Cardinals have had only three off Gooden. There it is on one and two. who walked is still at first. Lyons is on deck. Daly has the sign from Pena, and again, he works one and two. A big chopper. In comes Ozzy. Has time. They're out of it. Which brings us to another edition of State Farm's Rules of the Game. idea of the nearly impossible standards Dwight Gooden has already set for himself the 93 and 25 includes the 2 and 0 this year would make him if his career were to end now the best percentage pitcher in big league history Whitey Ford your old teammate at 690 Don Gullett his career tragically cut short by injuries was on his way to a possible Hall of Fame type career with the Reds and then the Yankees and look at Roger Clemens he's right in there too with what he's done thus far for the Red Sox Brunanski hits one hard in the left center. He might get a double out of this. Dykstra has to turn around to play it back into the infield. And Brunanski has opened the seventh with a ringing double to left center field. Since the third inning, when they scored their run, the only Cardinal hit off Gooden. Prior to that one by Brunanski had been a bloop double to left by Coleman. So they hadn't reached him at all. Maybe Brunanski has started something here. So far today, Gooden's most effective pitch has been his curveball. He really hasn't had the hard fastball. He's had a decent sinker. He's had 13 ground ball outs. Pena lines one foul. And again, trying to shoot the ball the opposite way. On the ground, preferably to advance Brunanski to third. Tony Pena, a four-time All-Star, three-time Gold Glove winner. 
not the player he once was, but defended against his critics by Whitey Herzog, who says that he's still a pretty good handler of pitchers, and he can throw well, of course. And Mike Rourke and Whitey got him out of that crazy stance he used to use in Pittsburgh, where he couldn't get pop fouls because he was down that one knee in that split situation. And they tried to cut his swing down a little bit, too, and he's choking up right now. He was swinging wild all the time. Big hole between third and short. Look at him. He hasn't been able to throw that riding fastball much for a strike today, which is what he tried to do to Bernanski to start him off with a hard fastball, get ahead, and Bruno jumped over. And we'll show you how good he is again because he can get the movement and keep the ball down and locate it along with the curve. Try to debate. Who's the best? Clemens or Gooden? Hershiser, Viola. Two and one. Wooden has struck out five. He's walked two. Both of the free passes came in the first. Three and one now to Pena. Okendo will be next. And Dwight has been pretty effective so far today. The ability to throw the curveball over the plate when he's behind in the counts. Twice today, three and two, he's whipped the curveball over and gotten hitters. This time he misses, runs at three and one. The outfield shades Pena around to the right. And the count is full. Might have been ball four. Looked like it was up out of the strike zone high. But Pena has always hacked at just about anything that he finds to his liking. Well, 90 plus upstairs is awfully difficult to lay off. Well, he tries to get on top of that one with the hands and the barrel. That's hard to do on that kind of fastball. But he did help him out. The 3 2 pitch. First, a bluff to second. And naturally, many of the fans holler balk. And that's really more to keep the runner at second from relaying location and sign. To keep him focused on the pitcher for a pickoff. And that might have been called Davy Johnson just to see what Bernanski's reaction would be if he is trying to call location. Here it comes on three and two. Foul ball. if you hit some three and two now. And, and that's what was in the back of Payne's mind. That's, he was trying to hit the ball in right field, but he was so darn late because he's protecting against good and good curveball. Worrell is throwing in the Cardinal bullpen, but the Met pen is quiet. It's in Gooden's hands for the time being. Same thing, foul to the right side. And that's what appears Tony's doing. He's really looking breaking ball and protecting against the curveball. And once again, up in the strike zone, out of the strike zone. Looks like somebody's going to be up in a second as Stottlemyre gets on the bullpen phone. Well, perhaps. There's, Got him. There's the hook. Another bad pitch. I mean, it's like three or four bad pitches in a row. Not ideal hitting conditions, but Tony's always been a free swinger. And the thing about it is, if he had taken the walk, the next guy, Okendo's a pretty good bunter. You could have the option of sacrificing and then going with the pinch hitter for Daly. So it had an effect on the inning. It's a real yakker right there, folks. Pena becomes Gooden's sixth strikeout victim. Randy Myers gets up. Okendo takes a ball. He has never hit. A left-handed home run. All nine of his career homers have come from the right side. The most memorable one, an unexpected blast in Game 7 of the playoffs in 87 off Atlee Hamaker of the Giants. That's yep. the one that won the pennant for St. Louis. Both managers have their closers up now. Just Sean Myers, and it's relatively early, but Whitey's already been through a lot of his bullpen early, and 
there's Todd Morrell. I think the Cardinals get the lead. I'm going to push Ken Daly too far, so Herzog got him up. And Randy Myers can get up because Davey Johnson knows he's got Ossie in reserve, who's pitched so well all spring and is a hard thrower. Willie McGee has moved on deck for the Cardinals. Well, Kendo thought that was ball three, so did the crowd, but Dutch Reynolds' opinion is the one that matters. There's McGee. Who, as we indicated earlier, along with Ozzie Smith, hits good as well as any other Cardinal. Two and one. Three and one. You know, when Mel Stoudemire got on the phone with the bullpen, he might have felt that having to extend himself, good and that is now Ossie joins Randy Myers, but with Pena following the high fastball up, usually that's a pitch if you swing it off Dwight Good, you don't even come close to it. Mel Stoudemire might have felt that the edge is off a little bit. Another full count situation. He went full against Pena who fouled a few off before swinging and missing at a pitch out of the strike zone. Go from the good, 90 plus usually. Myers, 90 plus from the left side. Davey Johnson, along with Buddy Harrelson, now looking ahead. What extra men are left? So he wants to plot his strategy, a couple of hitters and maybe an inning ahead. Ossie gets the ball up to 90 miles an hour too. Well, Kendo's gonna make good work. That, by the way, was the 100th pitch for Dwight Gooden, and Davey Johnson is well aware of that. McGee is waiting on deck to pitch in. And then Whitey has three left-handed batters, plus Pagnazzi from the right side to choose from. Another 3-2 pitch. This is the hardest that Gooden has thrown in this ballgame. Almost every pitch, a little bit extra to Pena and not Okendo. And isn't that characteristic of oh, the yeah. great ones? Something in reserve late in the game for when it matters, some hop on the fastball. Not a good strike to ball ratio in this game for good. A lot of those early pitches came in the first inning where he was three and two and three and one on three hitters. What a battle. Okendo hanging tough. thing about good pitchers like Gooden and the Clements is you never see him look over to the bench as if to indicate they want to come out. He's just focused in on Okenda right now. He love to finish. Brunanski away from second. A bouncer to second base. Bruno to third as Okendo is retired and now it'll be up to Willie McGee with two out. Big welcome for him. This is his first at bat at home this year. You wonder, and he has it good and very well as those numbers indicate but you wonder if Willie McGee who is a kind of a wild swinger with a bad background right now is going to be able to hit that curveball from Gooden. Swing and a miss oh, strike he one. He's thrown hard now. Last year the Mets provided Gooden with the best run support of any starter in the National League. They got better than five and a half runs per game on average when he started but this afternoon they've stranded 10 so he's working on the edge he's ahead of McGee 0 and 2 it's a one run game but the Mets have had many opportunities to bust it open here comes the manager on the field Mel Stottlemyre I don't think he even had to mention or motion to Keith Hernandez who went in just a reminder to good and as good as he is hey you know balls two strikes think before you throw the 0 2 pitch Person, Willie McGee, he doesn't know if he's hitting no balls, two strikes, or three balls, and no strikes. He just goes up there hacking. Oh, he never looks 
for a base on balls. A lot bigger this year, Bob, isn't he? He must go about 200 pounds after working with Mackie Shillstone. Still 0-2. And, and McGee has not yet seen a breaking ball. But he's up on the bat now about four inches. The 1985 Cy Young Award winner against the 85 MVP. Gooden to McGee. Ball one. Bernanski bluffing down the line, trying to distract Gooden. But he doesn't care. He's focused on the hitter. And there it is. Up the middle. The game is tied. He fell behind 0-2. He spoiled two, fouling them back after that. And then he drills a pinch single to center to tie it at two. Right good and very line struck with six consecutive fastballs. And that was a fastball out of the strike zone. One that a lot of hitters would have popped up. Somehow Willie got on top of it. Here comes Davey Johnson. Looking maybe for a double switch with Gooden, his third scheduled hitter in the eighth inning. He's calling Myers in from the bullpen. Howard Johnson is heading out onto the field. The possibility of Johnson facing Todd Worrell in the next inning is what's on mm -hmm. Davey Johnson's mind. If he inserts Hojo in the ninth spot, Daly's already been used. Herzog may have no choice but to let Worrell face his nemesis. Well, in the terminology of the players, Dwight Gooden went dead red for six consecutive pitches to Willie McGee. All fastballs. And when he got 0-2 on Willie, oh, Willie went up on the bat about four inches. Cut down his swing, and he got a big base hit to tie. Now Myers comes in and misses with ball one to Coleman. McGee at first, two out, game tied, two apiece in the last of the seventh. Howard Johnson is the new third baseman. Remember, he's had all kinds of problems throwing, four throwing errors already. Magadan is out. Myers hits in Magadan's spot. Hojo hits ninth. That'll make the seats. Tony, watch Dwight Gooden. He loses any chance for the victory, although he pitched very well. And usually he's restrained. He doesn't show his emotions. He waits until he's down in the tunnel, and then there goes the hat and the helmet. Don't think he was mad at Davey Johnson for taking him out. He was mad that he... Maybe mad because he stuck with too many fastballs. I don't know. I never saw a curve to Willie McGee. The strawberry coming in. Settle for the tie. McGee is left aboard, but his pinch single evens the issue after seven. I'm Marv Albert in New York. The latest from Sheffield, England. The count is now 93. At least 93 people were killed. More than 200 injured when soccer fans overloaded a terrace and crushed or suffocated fellow spectators. This occurred at a semi-final British League soccer match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest about seven minutes into the game. The stampede was triggered when late arriving fans pressed into one section of the stadium. Many of the victims were pushed against a steel mesh crowd control fence in the standing room area. A massive surge of people pushed hundreds of fans against the fence. Most of the dead were teenagers and children. This is the worst sports-related disaster in British history. I'm Marv Albert in New York. Back to baseball. Marv, thank you. Bob Costas and Tony Kubak back in St. Louis. Coming off that somber note, obviously, it places the world of fun and games in perspective. But we must resume here in the top half of the eighth. Todd Worrell has been summoned from the bullpen. And the third man due in this inning is Howard Johnson. 
Fourth pitcher that Whitey Herzog has used. Morrell, his fifth ball game. He's had just the one save. No control problem. He's walked three this year. There's Hojo. Practically salivating at the chance to face Worrell again. Meanwhile, Lyons is yanked. Left-handed hitter Sasser, another catcher, bats for him and fouls it off. Davey Johnson thinks at this point the best bat among his catchers could belong to Mackie Sasser. strike. Worrell, as most of you know, is one of the many relievers who works from the stretch under all circumstances. Nobody on, nobody out. He'll still come to the bell. He makes Pena's glove pop, but misses high, two and one. And the defense, as we look at the San Francisco Atlanta final score, but interesting defense, a hard thrower like Worrell, and Guerrero right on the line. It'd be unusual for Sasser to pull the ball right down the line, but those are the percentages to prevent the double. Oh, and an act of self-preservation. Worrell makes the play and records the out. Some felt that Todd Worrell was not throwing quite as hard last year and even this spring, and sometimes power pitchers have more difficulty in the spring. A tailing fastball. It's out of in a hurry off the turf. Ball caught him. Now they've moved in at the corners. Pendleton and Guerrero. He's Elster tries to drop a bunt down. Rip the defense straight away. Elster 0 for 2 with a walk. He was at the plate when the key play of the game thus far was turned in by Okendo. Bases loaded in the fourth. A little pop into shallow center. Thompson got a late break and wasn't able to get there. And Okendo went out and made a tremendous catch. Otherwise, two runs would have scored at least. And the inning would have been prolonged. This spring in St. Pete saw Todd Worrell quite a bit. Spring training and seemed like he was working more on his slider and even some off-speed stuff. Trying to go along with the great fastball. Looked like a slider right there, one and one. You saw that one nothing San Francisco final over Atlanta a moment ago. Don Robinson was the starter, left with an injury, a pulled thigh muscle. Atley Hamaker came in. He got the victory. Pete Smith was the loser for Atlanta. He had 13 strikeouts, pitched a complete game three hitter, and they broke his heart. He lost one nothing. And another young left-hander, Derek Willequist, got his first major league win the other day. Los Angeles three, Houston one. Hershiser gets a win over Houston. And John Smoltz, another right-hander from Atlanta. The other Smith Zane, they've got some great arms there. They would like to have that closer to help those young pitchers out in Atlanta. 2-2 Two -two pitch. Roll to Ozzie. One shortstop throws out another. The Cardinal bullpen is quiet. They do have a left-hander in DePino available somewhere down the line, and they have Quisenberry, but DePino and Quisenberry each pitched two innings last night. So now Guerrero goes to the mound, followed by Pena, to talk about what's on the mind of every fan in this ballpark. The past history of these two guys. Well, that's brutal from Worrell's perspective. You know, it's unusual, and I, everybody knows Hojo's a good fastball hitter, and that's what he loves, but for that few at bats to have that many faces off one man is one of the best in the game is just, uh, I, there's got to be some kind of luck in that. It's not all just pure skill. Fastball for a strike. Well, of course, as you say, Hojo is almost strictly a fastball hitter. Good breaking stuff. Really bedevils him. And Worrell just rears back and fires on most occasions. Ojo has turned a lot of those fastballs around. Oh, and two. What a boost it would be for Worrell if he could dispose of him. I remember one sequence last year, especially frustrating for Todd. He doesn't throw a changeup that often, but mindful of the past history and what Hojo was sitting on, he threw the Met third baseman a straight change, and Johnson hit that out of the park, too. 
on 0 and 2. Now Morrell, they had in the count. They did that 0 and 1, shooting the outside corner. That had a little sinker ball effect on him. Probably went with the seams and try and tail it away. So he's trying to pitch Howard away. If he's going to hit it, he's going to hit it the big part of the ballpark. He's got that luxury for another couple pitches. The competitor in him, though, says, let me come right at this guy. Let me establish something with him. Sometimes discretion, though, the better part of Valor, and he worked him up and away. Now they count two and two. Two outs, tie game. The outfields move way back, cutting the gaps down, and so that a ball is not hit over their head for extra bases. So Whitey playing the percentages. Who were paying you soon? And he hit it. We welcome those of you watching the Dodger game. Oral Hirschheiser with the victory. Bob Costas and Tony Kubek. Good one in St. Louis. Dwight Gooden was knocked out by a pinch single off the bat of Willie McGee in the last of the seventh that tied the game at two. Now it's in the hands of the bullpen aces. Worrell for the Cardinals. Myers for the Mets. Howard Johnson at the plate. The 2-2 pitch. Full count with two outs. Nobody on. Top half of the eighth. And for the benefit of those just joining us, we'll repeat that Howard Johnson in nine career at-bats against Todd Worrell has five hits, four of them home runs. You know, Whitey's scratching his head. Now we look at Davey Johnson. There's been a lot of players using this ball game already by both managers. And Whitey all but saying, hey, look, maybe you shouldn't even throw the strike. Change out ahead of him, 0-2, and, and then he walks him. So the mind game continues. And now Worrell is going to have to face Dykstra. And remember, Johnson can run. Stole over 30 bases two years ago, better than 20 in 88. But he's gotten into Worrell's head. In fact, in the second game of the series, earlier this year at Shea Stadium, after Johnson had homered against Worrell in the opener, Herzog admitted that he would have done something almost unheard of because this guy is his closer. Johnson was in the on-deck circle when Worrell finished the game. Had Todd not retired that hitter, Herzog had already told him that he was going to DePino, that he would not let Worrell face Johnson with the game on the line. And Whitey is bringing back the old Paul Richards trick. Taking a pitcher, moving the outfield, bring another pitcher in, and remove him, and then move that other pitcher back. Well, he's done it eight or nine times in his career. Blew the fastball past Dykstra upstairs. Stealer Worrell, even though he's big, does vary his delivery. He'll get the ball to home plate in less than a second and a half sometimes. When he's, sometimes he's a little bit longer when he wants to get a little extra on the pitch. Dykstra's one for four. Not going. High in the air. He got under it, though. Didn't quite get all of it. To the edge of the track, Brunanski to tuck it away. To the bottom of the eighth. Tied at two. Ball one low to Ozzie Smith as we start the last half of the eighth. Well, two of the smartest players in the game have helped get the runs today. Ozzie with a hit and run. Keith Hernandez, he hit and ran also through the vacated hole by Ozzie. Helped get a run, but the Mets, the story's been... A lot the same so far this year, with the exception of yesterday with a seven run inning in the fifth. They've left 11 stranded now through eight innings. And so that's not hitting to this point of the season with men on base. Cardinals have left five on. That's strike two to Ozzie, one and two. He'll be followed by Pendleton and Guerrero in his first game of the regular season. After opening the year on the disabled list with a ribcage injury, Ozzie is one for three.
We're seeing some pretty hard throwers, some of the hardest in the National League so far today. Morrell and Myers and Gooden. Ken Daly throws the fastball pretty crisply, crisply also. A different style of pitching overall in this league than the American League. More power pitchers. By the former Cardinal Jack Clark now with the Padres says he's so glad to be back. He wants guys to challenge him. He really got frustrated in the American League when they were dinking around on him with those 3 2 breaking balls. Inside corner, Ozzy's gone. And he jaws a little bit at Dutch Renard as he heads back to the dugout. Little different look fastball from Myers, and that was one of those inside part of the plate. It looked like a sail, like a cutter, a cut fastball. And throwing fastballs earlier in the count to Ozzy looked like they tailed away just a bit. Well, questionable. Dutch, Dutch may have widened that and got a little help from the catcher by caressing it on the corner. Mackey Sasser is the new catcher, remaining in after batting for Lions in the top half of the eighth. You talk to catchers and pitchers, anyway, and even hitters will tell you that, as we look at Mackey, one of the best ball and strike umpires in the game is behind the plate today, Dutch Renner. Everybody seems to think he's fair. Either way, neither a hitter nor a pitcher's umpire. And right down the middle. One and one. Randy Myers have what you would call a relief pitcher's mentality. When you look at the Raleigh Fingers and the Sparky Lyles and Bruce Suter, Randy Myers, they a little different twist, a little different look in their eyes, don't they? Have you seen <laughs> have you seen the new movie Major League? No, I haven't. Tom Berenger and Corbin Burnson and uh, Charlie Sheen in it. And our buddy Bob Euchre doing a terrific tour of duty as uh, the laughable play-by-play -play man. Charlie Sheen as the relief ace of this fictional club. That'll make the seats. Two and two to Pendleton. Gets the nickname of Wild Thing hung on it. Mm -hmm. And they start playing the old classic Wild Thing. That was a Trogs hit, as you well know, right. during the 1960s, mm -hmm. Tony. Robert Merrill sung it many times. Yeah. It, Robert Merrill did the cover version, but the Trogs scored big with it on the Billboard charts. Wild Thing, you make my heart sing. Mm -hmm. The 2-2 pitch is spoiled again. So, in any case, each time this guy comes out of the bullpen, the crowd gets into it. They play wild thing over the PA, and the fans are, are going nuts, and that's what greets his entrance every time. I'm sorry I brought this up about relief pitchers. Well, I would say <laughs> that a guy like Randy Myers could fit that mold, or a Mitch Williams in Chicago. It's uh -huh. consistent with your opinion. Pendleton swung about a half hour late at that pitch. And Myers has fanned the first two in the eighth. Well, and the conditions for hitting are still not ideal with the ball, a sunny background in center field coming into the shade, and you've got these hard throwers who are just seeming to overpower people now. Nice to see the goose got re-signed by the San Francisco Giants, another one of the great relievers of all time, with that different look in his eyes also. Guerrero was 0 for 3 with a strikeout against Gooden. Tags this one to center field. Got it off the end of the bat. Easy chance for Dykstra. And Myers works a perfect eight. Top half of the ninth coming up after this. Even Tony Kubek dubbed today Wild Thing. You know, uh, a couple of times in my career I went out with the Yankee Rat Pack. Mickey, Whitey, Cleet. I couldn't make it. Corrupting influence. Oh, my goodness. I don't know how Mickey did it. I'll tell you what. You you ask our buddy Bob Euchre when we get to Milwaukee for the Brewers-Tigers game next week. You ask him about that movie, Major League. Okay. I'm not saying it's... It's a classic. A, a classic. No, it's but it's funny. It's sophomoric, which certainly makes it to my taste. <laughs> Yeah, I saw you and Marv critiquing movies last World Series time last year. I never saw a baseball movie you didn't like. <laughs> There'll be some bad ones. It's Bob Costas and Tony Kubek, not Siskel and Ebert here as we move to the ninth. Warrell facing Jeffries. A ball and a strike to the Mets' second baseman. When you look at these two teams, uh, Davey Johnson just has more horses. I'm not going to say 
what's going to happen to the outcome of this game, but Randy Myers throws very hard. Now, Worrell is about the last shot for Whitey if this goes extra innings, uh, and as far as really a guy can blow you away. But you still got Don Ossie down there and Roger McDowell down there for the Mets, and that's just the kind of depth that you need over the long haul. 162 games, bench and bullpen means an awful lot. Here's Ossie. He wasn't even going to make the staff, but he threw so well in Florida. Jeffries, Strawberry, and McReynolds, the scheduled hitters in the ninth against Worrell. Fought it off, and it holds one and two. In the bottom half of the ninth, the Cardinals will send up Milt Thompson, Tom Bernanski, and the catcher, Tony Pena. Strawberry had a homer earlier today off Heinkel. Darrell's got three base hits. He's about out of his slip, it looks like. You know, a guy like Jeffries, with his swing, really shouldn't have trouble off any kind of pitching. They, uh, because it is so short and so quick, compact, if you will, he can wait on the off-speed pitches, a hard throw like Morrell. Because he's so quick and so simple, he can get the barrel out in a hurry. It's really not a very complex swing, which makes it so good. Struck him out. So Jeffries, who came in hitting 176, has a taxing day on April 15th. 0 for 5. And he spent about two months in Triple A ball. This is the back-to-back -back minor league player of the year you're looking at right here in the Mets system. But he was atrocious with the bat for a couple of years, and yet he still a couple of months last year, and yet he still finished in the 280s and 300 in the big league for the last month. As Strawberry steps in, let's look back to the sixth inning. Don Heinkel was nursing a 1-0 lead. This was his first pitch in the sixth. Goodbye. Three for four, single, double, and homer. Nobody on, top half of the ninth. Mets two, cards two. Two and oh. Now nope, check it. Dutch Renard with the delayed call, and it's one and one. That is what Daryl has learned also that if you think an umpire's missed it, I'm going to let the eyes moist up a little bit and show this puppy dog eye instead of griping because you might not get the next one. Mm. Swung oh. over it. One and two. The wicked slider right there. Well, you wouldn't know it on camera day when he fought Keith Hernandez in the spring. He has learned to control his emotions a little bit better. Strawberry. Got him too. From a riding fastball, a tough slider, then he went a with the seam fastball. It looked like it jumped away and all but sank. Tailing fastball. Look at the control that Worrell displays with Pena low in the crouch, sets up right on the outer edge, right at the knees, and he hit it. Now look at Daryl is getting on Renner saying, what are you doing? Put me in a hole. No balls, two strikes, which a hit will tell you. The first missed strike, they don't mind. When you go 0 2, Brunaski toward the line, loses the cap, but not the ball as he makes a lunging catch to take care of McReynolds into the arms of his buddies in the Cardinal bullpen. It is so much more helpful going into your own bullpen than the opposition, isn't it? The Cardinals take a crack at winning it when we come back. This may sound like a strange statement, but when you've got Ozzie Smith, the best in his position, on your team, he elevates everybody else's defensive play. And I think there's a lot of pride that goes into defense more than anything else. And we just saw Tom Bernanski, with a little help from his friends, not gifted with great speed, 
but the ball is fair, Bob. It appeared, and that gets by him, and it's a double. So he makes a very brave, not only attempt, but catch. And, and a lot of that has to do with Whitey Herzog's charts that he keeps all by himself, and the pitcher's going along with the charts. But more than anything else, it's taking a good infield practice and fighting the defense, and Whitey really puts that in his players' minds at all times. Last year, Herzog's team had lots of difficulty in games just like this. Close games into the late innings or extra innings. They were 7 and 17 in extra inning games. They lost a lot of games that were tied or in which they had a one-run lead in the seventh inning or later. The Mets, on the other hand, were very effective in situations like this en route to the championship in the National League East. The Cardinals also, with the kind of offense they've had the last few years, uh, just before they added Bradansky and Guerrero, had trouble scoring in pressure situations late. Some good numbers on that in the baseball analyst. And it's really that, rather than ineffectiveness on the part of the bullpen. After mm -hmm. all, they have Daly and Worrell. But when those games are prolonged and your closers can only work a couple of innings and eventually they come out and you're not producing any runs, going to catch up with you after a while. Yeah, that one base at a time offense is not as devastating late as the guy can come up and hit you a two or three run home run quickly. The quiz and Quisenberry. Pitched well in the spring, made the ball club. Helped from a couple of injuries to Whitey Herzog's pitching staff. Thompson in a one-two hole. Left-handed batter against a devastating southpaw in Myers. Rips it. Jeffries knocked it down, but it squirts away from him, and the winning run is aboard. came into the ball game with his bat smoking. He had an 0 for 4 going into this at bat and then off one of the toughest left-handers out of the pen in the game. It's a rifle shot. And it would have been interesting if Jeffries had not stopped that. That ball wouldn't have rolled as hard as it was hit with doubles. So Jeffries did a good job on the turf. That could have gone all the way to the wall as hard as it was hit. Now to the bunt Bruno. Hojo and Hernandez are trying to find something else. They may throw him for a tip off. Nope. All one high. Brunanski doubled off Gooden his last time up to lead off the seventh and eventually came home on the game time pinch single by Willie McGee. And of course, we've all heard, and Bob mentioned earlier, the throwing problems that Howard Johnson has had. Davey Johnson just moved him back about three strides. Still pretty close to the line. Swing and a miss. Sitting with Iffy bunts him over. He could probably have Pena walk to get to Okendo and then the ninth place hitter who's Morale. And so you would be butting him over to leave it to the eighth and ninth place hitters. And uh, at this point, Whitey didn't want to do that. Almost threw it away on what was just a, a calling card kind of move to first base. And a Keith Hernandez is the one who might call a play like that just to see if they've changed over to see if Bernanski's hand slides up the bat or something tells them that they may have gone to a bunt. It still looks like he's hit. The runner goes, swing and a miss. Sasser's throw, not in time. It's interesting because Keith Hernandez thought something was going on, and he asked for a couple of pickoff throws to first base so that Davey Johnson could try and read the runner, Milt Thompson. It almost looked like it was a somewhat delayed steal. I don't think he went out of the box. Look at Sasser. Didn't see him going, and that was a delayed steal. What the runner does is they wait until the ball is in flight where all the infielders and the catcher have to look at the baseball. And then he sneaked off on Randy Myers and stole a base. One and two to Brunaski. Two balls and two strikes. Thompson at second. Nobody out. Last half of the ninth. 
It's tied at two. There may be better teams, but I don't think there's a more exciting team to watch than the Cardinals. And with the added power of Bruno and Guerrero all year, if they're healthy, they're going to get more offense. Plus, the atmosphere in this ballpark contributes to your feeling, I'm sure. There are no better fans in baseball. They'll draw close to three million, maybe better than three if they stay in the race. The 2-2 struck him out. Here comes Keith again. A little talk with Myers. The count was run to two and two by Bernanski. And don't know if what Thompson was doing was trying to show location, but he had the left hand out. That could be a decoy, but he just throws it right by him. A little cut fastball. Jumped in under his fist. Myers has faced six hitters. Fan three of them. Pena. On the artificial surface, now when you've got a Pena up who doesn't have the power he once did, you look at the outfield arm, McReynolds outstanding, accurate and strong in left field, playing over toward right center, is Dykstra, good throwing arm, good throwing arm in right field in strawberries. In fact, at times it's great, but sometimes he takes a long time to get rid of it. Give you an idea what these outfielders can do on a base hit to the outfield. Good running speed on second, Thompson. Just as they did when he was facing Gooden, the outfield shades him around toward right. Strawberry near the line, McReynolds way off the line and left. This guy's not easy to pull under any circumstance, especially with that little glitter on the diamond from the sun and shade. 2-0. Big, big bat. He goes 37, 38 ounces, one of the biggest and heaviest in the major leagues. But tough to get around on this guy. Breaking ball. He held up. 3-0 to Pena. Pretty nice play by the catcher, Sasser. Green light, Tony? I would think so with Okendo up next, the eighth place hitter, and then Worrell to follow or a pinch hitter with Quisenberry going. I think Whitey will let him swing. Here it comes. In there. Johnny Lewis, the hitting coach, former Met outfielder in the foreground, and Whitey behind it. He walked him, didn't miss by much. Now the Cardinals have runners at first and second. And Okendo strides to the plate. Now there's one out and the situation changes. Well, there's nobody on first base. That infield, not in a double play situation, is playing back to knock anything down to prevent the runner from scoring from second base and the ball in the outfield. Now they will sneak in a little bit of double play down. Which, of course, on the turf creates a few more holes to hit through when you shade in a little bit. Ball one high and Pagnazzi, Tom Pagnazzi, has come out on deck. He would hit for Worrell. On the last pitch by Myers, Thompson off second base was getting a little bit more of a walking lead and took a few more liberties. Uh, Coleman has already stolen third base with two outs, and Thompson has good speed. Fouled off Sasser's mask.
The Cards have maximized their opportunities, relatively speaking. Stranding only five. Two balls and a strike. The Mets have left 11 men on base. In the sixth inning, they had four consecutive hits. Later got an intentional walk. One of the hits was a homer, and they scored only twice. Cardinal bullpen, Costello, Daly, and Worrell have done a good job. Myers trying to hold the fort for the Mets. Two and two. Jeffries with the catch. And that's going to be all for Todd Worrell. If Pagnazzi comes through here, Worrell could be the winner. But he's faced his last hitter. And if we go to the 10th, it'll be Dan Quisenberry on the mound for the cards. Well, Worrell got one of the key outs with his nemesis. Popped up Hojo Howard Johnson. Excuse me. He walked them all, but trying to pitch around him. Agnazzi, the reserve catcher. Pretty good hitter. Couldn't catch up with the fastball. is pumping some high octane gas one and one Myers not considered a control pitcher however when he does get ahead he will try and spot fastballs he has shown the breaking ball a little bit today but basically it's been in and out with a fastball Davey Johnson said when he says he's a control power pitcher he's crazy he just throws from the middle of the plate and lets it fly like that one and two. Pagnazzi hit 282 last year for the Cardinals in 195 at bats. In 87 at Louisville, he hit 313 with 14 homers. Not been comfortable hitting under these conditions against the power pitchers we've seen recently. Thompson at second, Pena at first with two out in the ninth. Two and two. Leads away from second with a potential winning run. Held up. Yep. Full count. Fred Brocklander down at first base. Figure pitcher with an average fastball, 85-86. You've got two fifths of a second as a hitter under normal conditions. With a Meyer or Worrell or Doc Gooden or some of the others the reaction time is less and then you throw this background out there and you start feeling for the ball just trying to put it in play Thompson set to go on the 3-2 pitch he can start walking now this inning's over Myers struck out the side with a single and a walk thrown in Agnazi the pinch hitter comes up empty we go to extra innings at Bush Stadium Andy Myers pitched two and a third, struck out the side in the ninth, and now he's finished. Don Ossi is already ready. He's been thrown for a while in the Met bullpen. Myers due to be the second hitter, so they'll bat for him here in the top half of the tenth. It's up to Dan Quisenberry now for the Cardinals, once one of the great relief pitchers of all time. From 1980 through 1985, the only time he failed to save at least 33 games in a season was the strike year of 1981 
when he had 18. So surely he would have been around that 33-34 figure had they played the full complement of games. He saved 45 in 1983 and 44 the next year for Kansas City. Quite a mix, too, isn't it? After the Goodens and the Randy Myers, Ken Bailey's and Morrell had come in with the quiz from the submarine style. He was struggling in Kansas City. Really he was no arm problem. Unusual for a pitcher like this to have arm problem anyway, but the harder he tried to throw, the straighter the sinker got. Now he's taking a little off. He's got a little bit of sinker back. He still has trouble with those left-handed hitters. Floats a strike into Hernandez. He's two for four. Has hit the ball hard in three of his four trips. Drives one toward left center field. Thompson got a good jump on it, and Milk gets there with a sliding backhanded catch. The jump was the key, Tony. Don't think there's any question of Milt Thompson's ability to go left, right, or back. He's had a couple of balls drop in front of him in this ball game. They would have been tough plays, but he shows you that laterally, he can go get him with anybody. Lee Mazzilli is the pinch hitter. Veteran switch hitter, once an all-star. Takes outside. And we've mentioned already 11 stranded through nine by the Mets, but some of that has been because of the defense of the Cardinals. And Rokendo's great catch on the looper to center of the bases loaded. Ah! Coleman made a nice running catch down the line. Ozzie's made a couple good ones. The 1-1 one -one pitch. Strike two. Mazzilli once a Met matinee idol during their lean years in the late 70s. He was about the only star they had. Dealt away to Texas in the Ron Darling transaction. Bounced from there to Pittsburgh. Eventually came back in 86. Line drive, base hit. Maybe extra bases. Brunanski to the line. Makes a good pickup and holds Mazzilli to a pinch single. One of those situations late in the ball game. Guerrero guarding the line. It was a bullet, but if he's playing his normal position, the line drives probably right at him. And Bruno, once again, got on that ball in a hurry like he did the catch on the line. Look at where Guerrero is. Doesn't miss it by much, but that's the percentages. Give him the single, prevent the double. Remember all the key pinch hits Mazzilli got in the postseason for the Mets in 86. And he's still got a little running speed that he could sneak off and steal a base for you. Especially with a left-handed hitter up and Quisenberry's delivery, which he's quickened up since he came to the National League, but it can still be... Double play ball. Ozzy, Okendo, and Guerrero to finish it. Well, all three batters really hit the ball hard off Quisenberry, but the Mets have nothing to show for him. Here's what happened elsewhere. They couldn't play at Yankee Stadium. Twins and Yanks postponed. Jerry Royce, seemingly ageless, the winner over Bob Welch, his old Dodger teammate, now pitching for Oakland. Baltimore beat their former mate, Mike Boddicker. The Orioles have already won five, so they're way ahead of last year's pace. Texas takes their record to 9-1. and one. They beat Frank Tanana and the Tigers 4-1. Bobby Valentine flying high. Saberhagen the winner. Kansas City beat Toronto 10-5. Bo Jackson had three hits, including a home run. Pittsburgh beat Montreal 6-4. Milwaukee over Cleveland 5-1. Rob Deere hit two homers. I see Molitor's back from Milwaukee, and Hagueras had two performances in the minor leagues and could be back shortly. Pete Smith, a tough luck loser for Atlanta, went the distance, three hitters, struck out 13, and the Giants beat him 1-0. And Hershiser got the W as the Dodgers beat the Astros. Ossie in the game, last half of the 10th. Top of the order for the Cardinals. Ossie, not quite the power pitcher he was a couple of years ago. Had the arm problems, some back problems. Still gets the ball up there in a hurry. Hitters will tell you that his delivery is deceptive. Like the ball is coming out of his shirt. And tough to pick up. 
He's fought through a variety of injuries the last two, three years. Behind Coleman, 2-0. and oh. And misses again. Now, during spring training, Whitey Herzog brought an old buddy, Bunny Mick, in to work with Coleman in St. Petersburg to give him a better philosophical grasp of what a leadoff man's role is. He'll be taking, and that's a strike. Coleman has stolen over 100 bases three times and then 81 to lead the National League last year, and this despite the fact that he has a very low on-base percentage for a leadoff man. He strikes out over 100 times each year, gets very few walks. They want him taking pitches. And he does here until the count is full. Funny Mick, the Yankee farmhand and the Yankee manager in the low minor leagues. And played on teams with Mantle, with Herzog. He was a Bunny instructor for the Houston Astros for a while. He once had a year in the minors, Bunny Mick, where he walked 104 times and struck out three. He has to swing now. Here's a chopper. Hernandez, underhand for right. Ossie. Yeah. Safe! That's another part of what should be Coleman's approach to hitting. Not just taking pitches, but hitting down on the ball, getting those choppers and utilizing the speed. Fourth time Vince has been out of this ball game, and you could almost hear up here, as the ball was in the air, Hernandez yelling, get over. He reminded him before he threw to Coleman in the event of a bunt. And Ossie is absolutely flabbergasted that he could be beaten the first base because he got off the mound pretty decently. Going on the first pitch. Oh, he's Ozzie blocked the bunt. He might go to third, but he nope. didn't know. Now he bounces up, but he's going to have to stay. He was unaware, and he went in head first. Otherwise, he could have made third. There are a couple of different theories when you are stealing a base or on a hit and run that about halfway down, you should glance over your shoulder to see if the ball is at where it is or for an incident like this. The other theory is the Joe Morgan theory. Make a beeline for that bag and don't break your stride. Ozzy, doing what he wants to do, tried to keep the bat above the ball. And he is saying, the ball is by me. The head first slide and the decoy down at second base. Now he realizes the ball is to the backstop. Another one of the problems with a head first slide, you can't get up quite as quickly. When Coleman gets on base, this ballpark is just electrified, especially in a spot like this. Ozzy could drop a bunt. Hernandez inching in. Bunts it foul. You've got so many options if you write a Herzog with an Ozzie Smith because of, of his bat control. Hernandez is so good that he was almost looking down Smith's throat. And he'll be charging again, trying to read this. Ojo's got to be careful. Well, that's right. If he it? charges from third, he leaves the base unoccupied, and Coleman could sneak in behind him. And that's the base you'd want to bunt to with Hojo's throwing problems. He bunts it toward third. At least he was trying to, but pops it foul. Yep. Now it's one and two. Now, if they take the bunt off, which is probably what's going to happen, Ozzie, with the bat control, he's done it once in this game, still able to pull the ball to the right side and get a ground ball there and get Coleman over. any manager in the major leagues over the past five, six years has been in more ball games like this than Whitey Herzog. Close games, time and time again. Ossie's one-two pitch. Still pulling. The the Let's see if they send him. With nobody out, they're going to stop it. He's a remarkable little player, isn't he? He hit a bad pitch up in the strike zone, and Davy Johnson was hoping he'd pop that pitch up. And Ozzie's still so intent after the two bunts went awry to get that top hand over and hook the ball to the right side, and he gets a base hit on him. And then just his glove in the last few years that's going to get in the Hall of Fame. Watch this. Watch him hook this ball off a high fastball. Completely intent, even with two strikes, getting the ball somehow to the right side after the two bunt attempts failed. 
Never thought he'd be an offensive threat eight, ten years ago, did you? But he is. Infield in, outfield shallow, ball one to Pendleton. Coleman with the winning run at third. Ozzie Smith at first, nobody out. Last half of the tenth. Coleman is three for four with the walk and three stolen bases. The pitch to Pendleton. Pitch he has trouble with, and they'd like to see him lay off. The outfield alignment, as Bob said, I mean, they're just playing like softball players. Look at the ground behind them. Any long fly ball, no contest anyway. Davey Johnson not employing a five man infield as some managers might. Here it comes on one and one. Strike two. Pendleton is 0 for 4. He did get an RBI with a second inning ground out. looking for the strikeout two and two Guerrero next to the belt to the plate pop back Sasser for a look it's in the seats. They're looking in from first base at Whitey Herzog. Jim Riggleman and Smith say, hey, look, they are giving me second base. Ozzy said, if I want it, I can have it. Up to this point, Whitey has held it. And they want to leave that base vacant, and then maybe they could pitch around, even to get to Guerrero, who you might, you know, get a uh, force out at home plate. So Whitey, to this point, is saying to Ozzy, uh-uh. Even though they're giving it to you, Keith's not holding you on. Don't take it. The other thing is, if he is going to go, you want your hitter Pendleton to be aware of it so he's not distracted. Oh, two strikes now. It's a little different story. I don't know if he's going. No, no. He is yeah. going. It changed. And it's fouled off. Another 2-2 pitch. Shallow left field. McReynolds with a good arm. Coleman might draw a throw, but he's not coming. Fernandez cuts it off. First and third, one out. And here comes Guerrero. And the ball reached the same packs. Coleman looked over to Rich Hacker and said, what do you think? And Hacker just shook his head negatively. He said, uh-uh. Not on McReynolds. The ball hit that shallow. Davy Johnson will have to make a decision. He'll have to keep his outfield in, but will he move them back in the middle of the diamond for double play off the bat of Guerrero? Now Keith will hold the runner on, try to prevent him from stealing second base. Will they remove the double play possibility? Hope he steals it. Guerrero's 0 for 3 with a walk. He's been very productive in the early going. Three homers and 13 RBIs already. If Guerrero hits the ball sharply on this turf, he'll be able to turn two. Ozzie got a bigger lead now. He's got almost two feet on the carpet. Not going. This will do it. The Cardinals win it.
Williams scores the winning run and what a day he had. When it comes time to pick an MVP. And Davey Johnson will have to answer the tough question, why with a proven RBI man like Guerrero didn't you walk and load him up? Even though Thompson's bat has been hot, right-handed and left-handed, but you at least got to force at home plate. A guy that's not as much of a power hitter, but that's just the way this beautiful game goes. And you start saying, why did Ozzie steal? Why did they do this? And he'll have to answer some tough questions. What a beauty of a ball game with countless situations to savor. And maybe, without trying to overstate it, the stage has been set. They've played four times. They've split them two and two. Maybe the rivalry will be extended. And again, it'll be the Cardinals and the Mets in the National League East. Maybe. The Major League Baseball Game of the Week has been brought to you by Pontiac. We build excitement by GMAC, the official sponsor of America's Dreams, and by Budweiser, Beachwood Age, for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. Greg Jeffries on the Met bench, trying to absorb the defeat. Pedro Guerrero strikes the final blow. 3-2 Cardinals in 10. Andy Rosenberg was our director. Ricky Diamond, our producer. Executive producer Mike Weissman in St. Louis with us this weekend. Steve Horn is always on the statistics. For Tony Kubat, I'm Bob Costas. See you next week, everybody. Either the Cubs and the Mets or the Tigers and the Brewers on the Game of the Week.